Welcome to Vicksburg, Mississippi. Behind me you see the Mississippi River, which is a pretty low point right now, uh, here in the middle of the summer. Across the river is Louisiana. Vicksburg is the site in July of 1863, along with Gettysburg, of the turning point of the American Civil War. This in the west, Gettysburg in the east. I would argue that Vicksburg was the turning point of the American Civil War. The importance of Vicksburg was recognized almost immediately as the Union put together a plan for winning the war. It was Abraham Lincoln who called Vicksburg the key, and he said, until the key is in our pocket, we cannot win the war. Jefferson Davis called Vicksburg the pin that held the two halves of the South together. And General in Chief Henry Halleck, who commanded all Union armies in 1862 and 1863, said that control of the Mississippi River from north all the way down to New Orleans, including Vicksburg, was worth more than 40 Richmond, Virginias. The first attempts to take Vicksburg were unsuccessful. They actually happened in the spring of 1862, right as General Grant was winning the Battle of Shiloh. After the Union Navy had taken successfully the city of New Orleans, which was by far the largest city in the South. They moved up river and began to shell the fortifications, which were pretty primitive at that point here in Vicksburg, but they were unable to overcome the strong guns even then. And so plans were put in place for a combined operation between the Navy and the Army together, and there were several attempts to make that happen. And the coming uh, episodes of this series we're going to explore from the earliest attempts uh, all the way through the successful surrender of the city of Vicksburg just what the Union went through in order to capture this strategic location there are a lot of reasons why Vicksburg is a difficult place uh, to capture one of them as you can see is its prominent point above the river it's on a bluff that looks down on the river, and so it's not easy to get to from shore. Uh, you can put guns here, you can fortify those places, and they're very difficult to get at from the water. Uh, another reason why is the swamps. It is surrounded, especially across the river in Louisiana, by swamps, uh, and it makes it very difficult to maneuver an army in and around. Uh, and of course, the Mississippi River is an incredible challenge. The river is constantly changing, uh, the heights and the, and the lows. It, sometimes it can be so shallow that uh, an inexperienced uh, Navy officer might run his ships aground because he doesn't know where the sandbars are. And of course, only the, southerns, uh, the southern uh, folks are gonna be the ones who know those things. All of these and many more things, including logistics and supply, uh, went into the challenges that caused it to take more than a year for the Union to finally successfully take the city of Vicksburg. Behind me is a statue of John C. Pemberton. He was commander of Confederate forces here at Vicksburg, appointed to that position by Jefferson Davis himself. He was a favorite of Davis. A lot of Confederates didn't trust him. He was born in Pennsylvania but fought for the South because his wife was a Virginian. And so uh, he, he came here with no combat command experience, was made a Lieutenant General. Previously uh, to this, he had been in charge of coastal fortifications, South Carolina, Georgia, that area. Had no combat command experience, uh, but was trusted by Jefferson Davis and placed in command here. Following the Naval siege in the city, in the summer of 1862, a decision was made by the Confederates to construct a line of defense that would ring the entire city and guard all land approaches to Vicksburg. Responsibility for design and construction of what became known as the rear line of defense was entrusted to a young major named Samuel Lockett. Lockett was the Army's chief engineer and he was also the chief engineer for the Department of Mississippi and East Louisiana. He was a West Point graduate, uh, second in his class in 1859. He was highly skilled and well-trained, and he went about his task with a great deal of vigor. He spent about a month reconnoitering, surveying, and studying this very unique topography around Vicksburg. And he found that he was confronted by a series of irregular ridges that were fronted and backed by these steep ravines that you see. 
Now, despite all of these difficulties, Lockett quickly realized that the city was a natural fortress, which he planned to make even stronger through the construction of field fortifications. His defensive plan called for a system of redoubts, which are rectangular in shape, redans, which are triangular in shape, lunettes, which are crescent shaped. Uh, and he said, connecting them by rifle pits so as to give a continuous line of defense. As designed and constructed, the defenses consisted of nine major forts and they were more than eight miles in length. They were anchored on either end by the Mississippi River above and below Vicksburg. The first battle between ground forces for the city of Vicksburg took place in this swampy field behind me and up the bluffs that you can't really see but are just beyond these trees at a place called Chickasaw Bayou, sometimes known as Chickasaw Bluffs. This was the spot where William Tecumseh Sherman's heavily superior force of over 30,000 Union soldiers attacked 9,000 Confederate troops who were on half rations a third of whom didn't even have shoes and were marching in bare feet. It was just after Christmas, and yet they held the ground and inflicted nine to one casualties on, to, on Sherman's forces. I had an ancestor who was here as part of the 22nd Kentucky Infantry. Their flag was so tattered that it's not even recognizable as a flag after this battle was over with. Grant's initial plan for taking Vicksburg involved a two-pronged approach in which he would march into northern Mississippi and serve as a diversion uh, while the attack on Vicksburg came in the form of four divisions led by uh, General Sherman. Sherman would march down, take the river from Memphis, and take the city from the north. Unfortunately, the plan began to unravel almost before it started. Grant's supply lines stretch nearly 200 miles from northern Mississippi through Tennessee and into Kentucky. Nathan Bedford Forrest and his cavalry began to wreak havoc on those lines, and so Grant decided to build a new supply depot at Holly Springs, Mississippi. Soon after it was completed, General Earl Van Dorn successfully led a raid to destroy it, capturing 1,500 Union troops and plundering more than $2 million in supplies. This action, coupled with forced raids in Tennessee, forced Grant to call off his plan and withdraw from Mississippi. Sherman, however, was busy making his way south from Memphis by ship to a landing at Milliken's Bend, Louisiana, 20 miles north of Vicksburg on the Yazoo River. He didn't get word of the cancellation of the operation, mostly owing to a disruption of telegraph lines by Confederate cavalry. Pemberton, sensing something was amiss, had 14,000 defenders on the bluffs overlooking Sherman's position. Once Sherman and his troops disembarked from the transports, they found no solid ground that worked uh, for marching on the city, but instead swamps, marshes, and bayous. In addition, Confederate troops created obstacles such as felled trees, rifle pits. They had sharpshooters and artillery positions. Sherman needed more than two days to travel the four miles he needed to position himself for an attack on the Confederates. On December 29th of 1862, after a small skirmish the day before, and after a, several attempts to get around the Confederate position, Sherman ordered a full frontal assault on the bluffs at Chickasaw Bayou. Though some of his subordinates had doubts about the plan, Sherman believed the operation could succeed. He said, we will lose 5,000 men before we take Vicksburg, and we may well lose them here as anywhere else. After a two-hour artillery bombardment beginning at 10 o'clock in the morning, the infantry advanced but immediately encountered problems. One brigade became lost and maneuvered in the wrong direction. Another couldn't make it across the bayou to get into the fight, and one found itself pinned down by relentless fire from the Confederates. After five separate attempts to take the bluffs, Sherman decided the position could not be taken. His force suffered more than 1,700 total casualties, while the Confederate losses amounted to fewer than 200. He withdrew back through difficult terrain to the transports waiting on the river. He decided against another assault further up the Yazoo River and ordered his force back to Milliken's Bend, possibly to await Grant. But at least temporarily, the Confederate victory at Chickasaw Bayou obstructed Grant's campaign to take Vicksburg by direct assault.
Behind me is an area known here as Grant's Canal. That's a pretty noisy area. I've actually got a relatively quiet moment. We're right next to Interstate 20, which runs uh, from Vicksburg across the Mississippi River into the Mississippi Delta region of Louisiana. So I'm gonna try to talk loud to overcome that as best I can. Grant's Canal was actually begun before Grant even got here. You see, in the, in the uh, late spring and summer, of 1862, Flag Officer Farragut brought his uh, blockading squadron up the Mississippi River after he had taken the city of New Orleans and began to shell the batteries at Vicksburg. And this went on for quite some time. And along with Farragut uh, was a body of Union infantry. That infantry actually took on the task of attempting to help bypass the guns at Vicksburg. Brigadier General Thomas Williams, who commanded the ground troops that were here, uh, had begun in the summer to dig a canal across a narrow, just over a mile long stretch uh, of land that came between two points on the Mississippi River that were relatively close to each other. And if they could dig a canal that was deep enough, enough and wide enough for the gunboats and the transports to go across, they could sail down the Mississippi River without having to go past the guns on the bluffs at Vicksburg. Now that plan was abandoned because in the summertime, as you can see from my visit here this week, the Mississippi River starts to go down uh, significantly, the water level. And so the concern was that the, the boats, Farragut's boats, were going to get stuck up here and not be able to get back down to Vicksburg, or to uh, New Orleans. And so they decided to withdraw and the canal was abandoned. After the disaster at the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou, Grant and his men that December and into January of 1862-63 decided to go into winter quarters and decided that it would be spring before they could once again resume the offensive against Vicksburg. But Grant did not want his troops to be idle and just sitting around, and so he put them to work. He put them to work back on that canal. At its height, between the summer of 62 and then into the winter of 62-63, there were thousands of Union soldiers, but also well over a thousand former slaves known as contraband to the North. Uh, men who had fled to the Union Army and were put to work uh, at uh, manual labor tasks that needed done. They started working on this canal, but malaria and other diseases took their toll. The heat in the summer took its toll. Men were dying from disease, dying from heat stroke, dying from the work, and it really was understood that there was very little chance that this canal even had of success. And what ended up happening was, even as they found themselves starting to get to the place where the canal was deep enough and wide enough, the Mississippi River water level began to rise. And as the water level began to rise, it began to overflow the dam they had built to hold back the water. It began to erode that. Also, the Confederates caught wind of what was happening and moved batteries into position so that they could be ready, if and when the canal opened, to fire on the exit. So any boats that came through the canal would be under heavy Confederate battery fire at the exit. And so, uh, in the late spring of 1863, Grant decided to give up on the canal. 